afternoon, everyone. What I'm going to do during this talk is to outline for us the basic understanding of the Church's teaching on purgatory. As you know, November 2nd, we celebrate the Feast of All Souls. All Souls is a significant celebration for us as Roman Catholics because it's our opportunity to remember all of our brothers and sisters who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith. Now, we believe, as the Catechism clearly teaches us, that purgatory is a doctrine of our faith. Let me repeat that, because I get a lot of questions about this. Does the Catholic Church still teach purgatory? It, it does exist. Yes, it does. It still is a doctrine of the faith. And what we need to remember is, is because it's a doctrine of the faith, that we believe that it is something that we have to hold on to to be true. This is what the Catechism tells us in paragraph 1030. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. What does that mean? It means to say that all people who die in the state of grace are assured of God's eternal salvation. It doesn't say guaranteed, it says assured of their eternal salvation. But after that, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. What that says is, is that when we die in the state of grace, when we are trying to live out our Christian faith each and every day, when we are certainly confessed all mortal sins or all sins that we're aware of, we die, we die knowing that one day we will achieve or enter into heaven. That's the need for purgatory. But we may have to go through the divine, what I refer to, purification of our own soul. Here's an image that I like to use. Actually, I shouldn't say I. Bishop Sheen used it, and I'm stealing it from him. So here's an image that Bishop Sheen liked to use, and I'm going to steal and use it as my own. If you went into a diamond uh, mine and pulled out a raw diamond, it would not look as a diamond that we would see at K Jewelers. All right? It would look very ugly. It would have all the sediments of the earth around it. And what the diamond jeweler would need to do is he or she then would have to purify that diamond of all of the imperfections around it. Would have to cut off all of the sediments around it. And by doing that, it would then help the diamond to be what it always intended to be. Something beautiful, something that we all look at, something that we can all appreciate. Because of that concept, that's kind of what we refer to when we talk about purgatory. When we die in the state of grace, we are needing to be purified of our sins so that we can inherit what we initially received at our baptism, and that was the promise of new life. But we have to go through a purification. So then what the Church tells us on paragraph 1031, and this is in the Catechism. If you have a Catechism at home, you can go and find this information. It's important that we recognize where the Church teaches these basic truths. 1031 tells us this. The Church gives the name purgatory to this final purification, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. So we're not talking about people that are suffering hell, which again, is something that we also believe exists. We don't believe, we, we don't say that anyone is in hell, we just recognize that it does, is a place where the devil and his angels do exist. Do people go there? They do. But we don't condemn anyone to hell. What the Church tells us furthermore is this, the Church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the Church, by references to certain texts of Scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. What the Church does remind us is, is that we have two basic beliefs that we have as Catholics. We have capital T tradition, which would be sacred Scripture. That's our tradition that we receive revealed to us by God as is interpreted through Scripture. And then we have small t tradition, those traditions that we have. For example, not eating, eat, eating meat on Friday is a small t tradition. Something that was received that's not necessary for our salvation, but certainly a discipline that we need to practice. The councils of Florence and Trent give to us the belief and the understanding of a capital T tradition, that purgatory exists. And what do they do? They interpreted the scriptures. Through the interpretation of scriptures, we were able to then believe and understand that there is such a thing as a cleansing fire, a place where the souls of the just receive their purification so that they, in turn, can one day experience the joy of heaven. Now, many of our brothers and sisters who are not Catholic 
sadly many of our Catholic brothers and sisters who also don't understand this, would sit there and argue and say, well, where in the scripture does it speak about purgatory? Specifically, we always refer to 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 38 through 47. I'm only going to read a part of it because it's what's quoted in the Catechism, but I would encourage you to read it on your own. But this is what we say. Therefore, Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. Well, if there was no purgatory, why would he have to make atonement for the dead? If they're already damned, or if they're already in hell, why would he have to make this atonement for their sins? We recognize in that passage that there is a way of receiving or helping those souls. And that's where we get the concept of praying for the dead. During the month of November, we pray for the poor souls in purgatory. We have mass intentions offered for our loved ones who have died. We pray for our loved ones. And all of these beliefs that we have come through the church's tradition of what we receive from 2 Maccabees when we interpreted that correctly and said, oh, this is what the church is referring to. So why does the church continue to pray for the faithful, to pray for the souls in purgatory? So the Catechism tells us further. From the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers and suffrage for them. Above all, the Eucharistic sacrifice. Remember, in the early church, it was very common practice that the altar would be over the, the tomb of a martyr, where we get the belief of having a relic of a martyr in, the, in all of our altars. That's where this tradition developed from, because the early Christians would celebrate Mass on the tomb of the martyrs. And they would pray for them, and they would remember their names. So that, thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. The Church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. I strongly encourage all of us to recognize the value of praying for our deceased brothers and sisters, to pray for all of the dead. Do not assume that anyone who has died has already entered into heaven. We need to continue to pray for them. We don't know when they're going to enter into heaven. All we do know is that we want to continuously pray for them and continually offer our prayers on their behalf because its value is great and certainly important. Obviously, it's also a spiritual work of mercy. You may not know this, but it is. A spiritual work of mercy is when we pray for or intercede for the living and the dead. So a spiritual work of mercy. So you're, in a sense, you're doing two acts of goodness for the dead. You're praying not only for their salvation, but you're also performing a spiritual work of mercy that is so necessary in our church today. So again, why do we do this? Because the church commends all of her children and desires all of us to experience the new life that God has first promised to us. I rejoice that there is a purgatory. I'll share with you a quick story. When I was at St. Charles, I had a uh, funeral of someone that died. And when I asked the family about this person, I was receiving the information that he wasn't what you would consider to be a very holy, decent person. I didn't really receive much goodness from this individual. But after inquiring about this, the a daughter assured me that he was indeed a good person. And I thought to myself, I got it all wrong. I can be a complete jerk, do whatever I want to do. All I have to do is be a good person, and that's going to assure me of my salvation. My sisters and brothers, we cannot be deceived that simply being good, doing the things that the Lord asks us to do anyway, is not going to assure us of salvation. Mother Teresa was more than just a good person. She did the things that the Lord asked her to do every single day. I'm not saying that we have to be like Mother Teresa, but we also have to recognize the value of performing not only the spiritual works of mercy every day, but also participating in the corporal works of mercy as well. Because this will not only make us good people, this will make us strong and faithful Christians. Now, Real quick, before we conclude, let's speak just real briefly about the concept of indulgences. During the month of November, there's many indulgences that we can receive from the church on behalf of the dead. And I would strongly encourage that you take advantage of these. Going to Mass on All Souls Day, participating in Mass on All Souls Day, we can receive an indulgence on behalf of our loved ones who have died. Visiting the cemetery on All Souls Day, we can receive an indulgence on behalf of the dead. Praying for the dead on All Souls Day, we can receive an indulgence on their behalf. And what does that mean? That means to say that God is able to reduce their punishment and able to allow them to experience the new life that was first promised to them. So an indulgence is kind of like this. If I got in trouble in school and I was in in-school suspension, the principal only had the authority to reduce my sentence. So if I had three days, the principal comes in there after a day and says, you are now able to go forth in school. Your sentence has been reduced. 